just under a year ago, Pokemon Sword and Shield released after a buildup to the release date that was marred by controversy. Fans uh, of Pokemon and Nintendo alike, many of whom were outraged at most of Game Freak's decisions on the development of the game, what had been in the game and what was not included in the game. It was a hellscape for about a year. Since then, we've had two uh, parts of their DLC expansion release, and I think that most fans who are objective can probably say that it addressed almost all of the problems and controversies of Sword and Shield in a lot of really good ways. With that being said, this is my full review for the second part of the Pokemon Sword and Shield DLC, The Crown Tundra. There's a lot that can be said about the Sword and Shield uh, games as a whole, Generation 8 as a whole up until this point. Whether it was the criticisms of the games from the very beginning, which was a lack of Pokemon inclusion, uh, the, the design of the games in general, whether it was the graphics or whether it was the continuation of routes instead of just moving to a totally open world format. Or if it was that the story was incredibly to some lacking and didn't seem to take to take example from Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, which had a fantastic story. In my opinion, the second best story for any Pokemon game, second only to black and white, which nowadays most people praise as being the best generation of Pokemon for storytelling. At least that's what most people seem to say nowadays, unless you're into passive storytelling, of course, which is a whole different can of beans. But as we saw over the next year, since Sword and Shield's release, we're pretty much a year out from last November when the games first dropped and we first finally were able to play them and experience them for ourselves. The DLC, the Isle of Armor, which I reviewed back in July, June, it's been a long time, and now the Crown Tundra, which we're reviewing today, at least in my opinion, took some of the low points of Sword and Shield and vastly improved them. And when you look at Sword and Shield as games today, when you look at the base game and then you look at the two DLCs, it's probably one of the best Pokemon generations in terms of one single set of games that we have. I wouldn't put it po higher than Generation 4 or Gen 3 or Gen 5. Those are my top three personally, but I would put it in that upper echelon of solid Pokemon titles from the, the, uh, amount, the Pokemon you're able to select from in the game whether it was the original 400 Pokemon in Mainland Galar or the new Pokemon that were re-added from Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra. There is a great roster here. Now, there are a couple Pokemon that are missing, some of which seem to be missing for very obvious reasons. Could be a hint towards a remake next year of a particular generation that is very fond to many of us. Um, if it's the incredible character design of all the gym leaders, your rivals, uh, some of the protagonists and antagonists that you come across, besides Team Yell, um, to the designs of the new Pokemon. Everything that you can tell a lot of love got put into hit out of the park. They, they knocked it out of the park. The character designs, which I just mentioned before, are fantastic. Almost every single one, besides Shieldbert and Swordward, or Swordward and Shieldbert, those two assholes at the end of the main game, the character designs and the personalities of all the characters are fantastic. And all of that is continued here in the Crown Tundra, which for this being a Crown Tundra review, it's been about three minutes now and I have yet to talk about the Crown Tundra. So let's jump right in and talk about the Crown Tundra, the second of the DLC expansion pass, the second edition to be released, released last week. If you guys didn't check out my pre-Crown Tundra gameplay thoughts video. It'll be in the card up in the right-hand corner right now. You can go check it out. Be very appreciated. Um, it delivered. It absolutely delivered. One of the things that we saw praised in the Isle of Armor, and I praised it as well, is that it felt like the, the level design for the Isle of Armor was that next step in the advancement of what a Pokemon game should be. Vastly more open world design, uh, town, uh, buildings and characters in the open areas themselves instead of sectioned off in towns and cities, a ton of explorable locations for you to go to. 
uh, tons of different and varied static Pokemon encounters in the overworld that you could just run into. Great for shiny hunting, great for adding some new Pokemon to your team if you didn't actually beat Sword and Shield yet, which, for those of you who don't know, you can come to the Crown Tundra and the Isle of Armor right after, I believe, Wedgehurst. So you can come really early in a new playthrough of Sword and Shield and get some of these Pokemon for your team. There were a lot of really good level design enhancements in this Isle of Armor and now Crown Tundra DLC. The level design of Crown Tundra in specific is something that I really want to hit on. They did not show us a lot in the trailers, and it's something that I really got a praise Game Freak for. There were so many locations and areas to visit and find uh, treasure and items and different Pokemon in that we were not even aware of from the trailers. The Crown Tundra is a very compact location, but it has so many different winding paths and different locations to find that it feels so much bigger. Some of the locations that they advertised in the trailer, whether it was the Dyna tree or the dead ice wooden tree in Calyrex's temple, are barely important to the story. They're barely important locations except for nice set pieces. The, war, the, the real areas that have uh, different treasures to find, different ruins of legendary Pokemon, references to other things in Sword and Shield, or areas that just tell the story of the Crown Tundra and the, the history that you can feel that it's steeped in, were completely kept away from us in the advertising and uh, commercials for this expansion. It's great. There's a graveyard at one point in the Crown Tundra where you find a polka doll placed at the grave, and it's those little dark things that Pokemon has always done so well that they never told us about in the advertising. Never hinted at it. So many nice callbacks, references. The world of the Crown Tundra feels old. It feels lived in. It feels like there's a history there, and it's the best part of Generation 8 in terms of world building. Besides the cutscenes of Zacian and Zamazenta that Sonya gives to you, this is the best location and the best world building incorporated into a location in Generation 8. It is Pokemon at its finest, giving you the legends of the world, exploring how the relationship between people and Pokemon grew over time to where it is today, and then implementing that relationship into the current world your character is in. It's the best thing that Pokemon does. And the atmosphere of the whole location as a whole is just fantastic. I'm a huge fan of snowy locations in video games. It's the, it's the climate that I love the most, uh, whether it's the seasons in real life, fall and winter are my favorite seasons, or if it's just something you don't see a lot in video games. You always get the tropical areas and you always get the temperate areas. You, you don't always get really well done winter and fall themed areas. Johto does fall really well and the Crown Tundra does winter exceptionally well. Whether it's the Pokemon you can encounter like giant Mamoswine walking over the, the frozen tundra that is the Crown Tundra, or if it's seeing different fossil Pokemon that we've never seen before in the overworld. We've never seen a lot of these fossil Pokemon living and breathing and existing in the current world. Again, it speaks to that history that I referenced before. This place feels untouched by time, and it's probably because of the incredibly cold climate that it, it is. It's incredibly hard for the people who live in the Crown Tundra to live here. It's a bunch of small little communities like they advertised in some of the, the run-up to this release. Freezington, the main town in the Crown Tundra, is full of what appears to be pretty old people. They've been here a long time. They're very out of step with the rest of the Galar region. The rest of Galar is very much focused on battling. They're very much, fo much focused on the sport of Pokemon. You can tell that with the Gym Challenge, which Sword and Shield did very well. It's the best implementation of gyms in any generation. But this area, this place in the Crown Tundra, is very detached from that. It's where people go to settle down. It's full of hardship. It's always snowing. It's always hailing. It's always cold. It's a very small town. The mayor is one of the central focuses of the game, and he doesn't even fully understand the history of people who are here. For the most part, he thinks the legend surrounding Calyrex, the main legendary of the Crown Tundra, is just a child's story. They set up the tone and the world so well, and it works with the characters we get introduced to. It works with Peony uh, uh, and his daughter, where you can see that his daughter is very much with what Galar is today, but she still loves the legends. She still loves raiding in Dynamax adventures. 
and Peony is just very interested in the uh, uh, uncracking the history of the Crown Tundra, and he's amazed when you help him do it. All of it is so well done. The characters are so well done. The the implementation of legendaries, while I would have liked to see more story for the Regis, especially the two new Regis, and for the Galarian birds, their implementation is great. Getting to find roaming legendary birds in the overworld is is what roaming should be. If they want to move forward and introduce roaming Pokemon, roaming legendaries specifically, as more of a prominent thing, if it's with this format, I'm all for it because it feels more natural. It feels like what you would do if you were trying to hunt down an incredibly powerful, an incredibly rare and just worshipped Pokemon like legendaries are in the Pokemon world. This is exactly how you do it. It's not running into random grass patches and oh, I randomly found it like is iconic for Johto and, um, and Sinnoh with the birds and with the legendary dog trios. They do it so well. It's just another thing that really makes you feel the powerfulness, the atmosphere that is the crown tundra. The level design is great. The Pokemon designs are great. The character designs are great. Dynamax Adventures, the big advertised feature. You can go there and you can catch legendaries. There were a lot of us that were a little on the fence about it when they told us we were going to have to use rental Pokemon. Couldn't use our own. What about the Swampert that I brought with me from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire that I got in 2014? I would love to use him in Dynamax Adventures. You can't. The alternative is that we're using rentals. We're using Pokemon that we randomly get, and we can catch new ones to replace them as we go through the dens. And it adds a lot of strategy and a lot of planning to these adventures, and it makes every single one a lot more interesting. I was dead wrong about adventures, about Dynamax adventures. I did not think I would like it, but the reduced shiny odds for legendaries is a great incentive to keep going back. The difference every time you play it, from the Pokemon you catch to the competition on uh, random multiplayer rounds where you want a Pokemon, but another one wants a Pokemon and you might not get it, but you might to the varied items and swapping and healing uh, things that you can acquire in the adventures themselves to boost your Pokemon and give you a better advantage. Once you get to the legendary, it's all done incredibly well. It's probably one of the best it's the best implementation of catching legendaries in terms of its approachability that they've ever had. Whether it was the Hoopa rings in the past or other ways that in the past that Game Freak have given us access to old legendaries, it always felt very forced. This one, it's forced. I'm not going to lie. It's legendaries in a bunch of caves. It doesn't make much sense. It's Pokemon, but it's it's done in a way that is very approachable. It's done in a fun way. That is, it's great. That was the big feature. Calyrex's story, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. That was the other big thing they advertised. Let's just say there's two new legendary Pokemon introduced in Calyrex's story, and it's compelling. It's a story about forgotten history. It's a story about a civilization that once was, that once worshipped this creature that because of the passage of time has forgotten about it. And Calyrex itself feels that loss. It feels like it used to have something with the humans of this land that it no longer has. And it's up to you to help bring that trust back, restore that bond because you're a pure hearted person and you're a good guy, all that stuff. Basically Pokemon hero's tale kind of stuff, but it's really good. And if you want to experience Calyrex's story, go play it. So my biggest recommendation here is that the Crown Tundra is worth your time. If you played Sword and Shield back last year and you felt that it was a very shallow game, which a lot of people, that was the criticism. It's $25 more to get the full DLC, but it's the best $25 of the entire package. The Isle of Armor is great. The Crown Tundra is great. It's really great. Whether it's Pokemon following you, which we got in Isle of Armor, but it's great here too, uh, to the legendaries, to the story of Calyrex and the story of this town of Freezington. To the relationships with a lot of these new people you meet, it is fantastic. The Galarian Star Tournament is also something that was introduced in this package. It's a little separate from Crown Tundra, and I want to do a, a whole video dedicated to discussing it because I think it's a really good example of where post-game battle facilities need to move in the future. We're going to talk about that separately. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it here. But overall, Crown Tundra is worth your money. The DLC as a whole is worth your money. It is where Pokemon needs to go from its level design to its implementation of characters and story. This is what Game Freak needs to circle and say, if we're going to take anything from Gen 8, we're going to take this. This is perfect. This is great Pokemon. This is really good Pokemon. And if you 
have ever played a Pokemon game and you've enjoyed it, and you thought, I'd like to play Pokemon on Switch, but Sword and Shield had a lot of problems. Get it, play it, get this DLC. It's great. It'll fill that need. Maybe it's a little short in terms of story content, but it's fantastic. It's great. Gets my seal of approval every single time. With that being said, this video is a wrap. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this Crown Tundra review. If you want to see more Pokemon content in the future, I would really appreciate your support on this video. This is a long one. This is 14 minutes. Drop a like. Let me know in the comments if you agree with my review or not. And with that being said, I've been Linky, and we will see you all in the next video. Peace out.